morning, everyone. This is really odd, I think. I'm talking to you and I'm listening to it vibrate upstairs. But on behalf of the Historical Society, I want to welcome all of you all to Car Place. Some of you all are return visitors, and we are so glad that you're here. And we hope that you'll continue to visit with us um, just to go over a little bit of what we do here. Um, we are a community event center as well as an archive center, and we have you can rent this space for parties or weddings or receptions. We have roving exhibits. Um, we're excited about one that's going to open in March, which is um, Piecing It All Together, which is an American history quilt exhibit, quilts from the Eastern Shore and from Maryland. And then in October, we're going to open with a World War I exhibit. So we're pretty excited about that. Just looking around here, I can't imagine what Agnes would be saying or John about all this technology running through these <laughs> walls. They were like, how do you, we, we gonna get connected from the basement to the top? And I was like, well, there's two pretty good sized holes in the ceiling of the basement, so I think we got her. <laughs> so anyway, we are thrilled to have you here and we are thrilled to be able to host the third part of this trilogy. And I'm gonna hand over the mic to Carla so that she can go ahead and fill you in with the rest of the details when we get the program started. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Hillary. This is the culmination of three years and three Februaries of work and thought and um, cooperation with the Historical Society of the Eastern Shore and YS Consulting. Uh, we started here in the basement in 2015 uh, with downstairs at Kerr Place, 2016 actually. Downstairs at Kerr Place featured slave narratives that were gathered during the Federal Writers Project uh, during the Great Depression when the Alphabet uh, Acts put people to work. And there are actually 2,400 slave narratives that can be found on Ancestry.com. They've been uh, they've been digitized, and you can look at them, print them off, read them. Slaves from all over the South. Uh, the Federal Rod Writers Project also took care of minors. They spoke to Pullman porters. They spoke to Dust Bowl survivors. So it's really quite interesting what you can find there. But that's where we started. And lots of the work done by the car slaves was probably done right down here in the basement. In 2017, we brought it upstairs, and we had a lively and lucid panel of 90-year-olds, five 90-year-olds we spoke to about the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, and they gave us information and, and bits of history that uh, we wouldn't have gotten in, in a book or from any other source, and that was terrific. So this trilogy now culminates tonight with the technology and with the timing that allows us to broadcast from three different places. Now, it may not look like we needed to do this tonight, but last year we had people up the stairways. They were spilling out of the room, the green room, which was where we were centered last year. We had 95 people here, and as I understand that, that was one of the largest events that Car Place had ever had. So when talking to Hillary this year, I tried to figure out how can we make sure everyone's comfortable and everyone is still able to enjoy the program in this age when this home was built before open concept. She thought, well, we could move it to the uh, United Methodist Church. They let us have things there. But the, the history behind this house is the whole point of the historical society being housed here. And I wanted to figure out how to do that. So we consulted with Chris, who videoed last year, and those um, DVDs are available. And he and his father, along with my husband, uh, Norm Wells, they kind of figured out how we're going to wire this thing so that you will at least see one third of the program live and not have to move to see the other two thirds of the program. So as you see in the acknowledgments, My Way Leasing uh, worked with us in getting the monitors. Uh, Chris and his father uh, wired everything, set up the tripod. Um, I, I'm just delighted to, to be a part of this and the trilogy, I believe, will end it, but you never know. So tonight, we're going to bring the civil rights era to you. In this space, we're going to talk about integration. 
in the space contiguous to us upstairs in the green room we're going to speak about education and next door we're going to talk about religion and its role in the civil rights era and gaining justice and equality which we're still working on black lives matter we must overcome uh, for African Americans and I say black people you know it, it, it's interchangeable it just depends on how and on, on how it fits and rolls off the tongue in the sentence so tonight you're going to hear from uh, some well-known speakers and some not so well known to the shore and they're going to share their information with you um, I want to start right now with Ann Jimerson. Ann Jimerson is a lady who came to the shore back in 2012 to document the desegregation of Virginia education on the shore. She is a co-founder of the Dove Project, De Desegregation of Virginia Education, and the Eastern Shore was not represented. So Joan Smith Spady and her husband worked at the community college with Dr. Glover, all black history names right there uh, for, for shore history. And they called about 20 narratives at that time. We had another event, and somehow I became the chairperson for the Eastern Shore. We had another event at Marion Smith, and Ann and I became fast friends. And she was kind enough to come from Washington, D.C., and she's going to tell you quite a bit about her story right now in discussing Birmingham, which was really uh, the turning point for the civil rights movement, and she'll tell you about that. Ann Jimerson. Thanks, Carla. I'm so happy to be here with you. Carla's right. I came here to the eastern shore of Virginia um, almost six years ago to work on Do the Dove Project, but that was after having been many years, by now it's been 30 years that I've been coming to Chincoteague to enjoy the beaches here and the fine people of the eastern shore of Virginia. So I'm happy to be back amongst you and glad to have made the drive from Washington today. Years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Birmingham, Alabama is the most segregated place in the nation. Now I don't know on exactly what measures he was calling that, but it certainly was a city that had been built on racism, had been, um, was really just a very racist place. Now when I was a young child, my family moved from New England, where uh, my dad was a pastor and had been in graduate school. Uh, he took his dream job, which was chaplain at the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia. He really wanted to work in that kind of justice work, working with prisoners in Petersburg. So by the time I was a child, we moved to Hopewell, Virginia, where I was in school, and where my dad, by the time I was 10 years old, my dad had um, gotten very involved with a group in Petersburg, uh, a pastoral group on civil rights, where he met um, uh, Wyatt T. Walker and other pastors and other who were very interested in changing things. Yeah. So as a white northerner, he was in the minority, but while he was at one of those meetings, he met a man traveling up from, I believe, Atlanta, who was uh, with a group that was recruiting someone to take a job in Birmingham, Alabama, to work in civil rights. Now, it was a bit of an odd thing for a white family, a whole family. My dad had four kids by then, um, and it took six months, apparently, to convince my mom that we should make this trip. But we moved ourselves, our whole family, to Birmingham, where uh, we had no idea just how exciting times would become. But as my brother, who's written a book about the experience right here, Shattered Glass in Birmingham, as he pointed out, what, about the time we moved there was just a few weeks after the bombing of one of the uh, Freedom Riders buses in Anniston, Alabama, and the beating of those young people in Birmingham, Alabama. So that kind of was the beginning bookend of our time there. And by the time we left in 1964, the U.S. had actually passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it was a very busy time in civil rights and also in Birmingham, because in the midst of that, in 1963, um, it was a very big year for Birmingham. Um, for decades, local folks had been struggling and pushing and trying to get some change, especially a pastor named Fred Shuttlesworth. Has anyone heard of Reverend Shuttlesworth? 
very, very big player. Um, he had been pushing and pushing and was part of Martin Luther King's organization, Southern Christian Leadership um, Conference, and had been really aiming to try to get the movement to come to Birmingham to make some change. So the target, by the spring of 1963, the target was to get some changes to the, um, the hiring practices and the pra other practices, social practices, of some of the downtown businesses, like the department stores. It was not a big win, but they were looking for that. Um, if you put together, it wasn't until I went to visit the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute many years after I had moved away from the city that I looked at a timeline on the wall and I said, all of that happened in one year. I had, could, I had remembered all these events, but I hadn't realized that it all happened in 1963. So at the beginning of 1963, George Wallace was inaugurated for the first time as governor of Alabama, crying for segregation forever. Uh, by spring, SCLC had come to town with Martin Luther King. They began marches downtown and negotiating with the businesses. And Martin Luther King was jailed. Several of them were jailed. And that he wrote his letter from Birmingham jail during that time, a very important piece of, very important document that was written in several pieces and smuggled out. Um, really a beautiful piece if you haven't read that. By May, they weren't getting too far because many of the local folks were fearful of losing their jobs or worse. Um, some of you may know that Birmingham had the nickname Bombingham because over 50 different homes and some churches had been bombed. No one had been killed. Um, it was a really dangerous time. Um, so by May, it was losing, the movement was losing a bit of steam when they came up with the idea of having the children march. How many of you have heard of the Children's Crusade of 1963 in Birmingham? Hundreds and hundreds of young people sneaked out of school, took their toothbrushes with them, ready to go to jail, lined up, marched, and got carted off by Bull Connor, put into jail, and it made so many headlines throughout the nation and around the world that it really, through shaming some of the folks in, the white folks in Birmingham, brought about change and really got national attention. So also that summer was when John F. Kennedy, who was president at the time, um, gave the first national speech about civil rights. Later that summer was the um, March on Washington in August of 1963. And only about three weeks later, there was a horrific bombing Many of you probably recall what that was. The uh, 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed on a Sunday morning while children were getting ready for Youth Sunday and killed four little girls. Later that afternoon, two young men, two young black men were also killed in separate events but related to the violence that had happened that morning. And by November was when uh, Kennedy was shot. So all of that happened in one year. The next summer was when the Civil Rights Act was passed. And re people really can draw a straight line from Birmingham and the events there to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So the bombing of the church had spe special meaning for us. Our parents were, of course, distraught when they heard this happened. Um, we, my, we had been at church and got home, heard it on the radio. My mom was still singing at the choir. Now, naturally, we were in an all-white church um, later that day, my dad tried to call some white pastors and get them to come together and offer condolences to the community, to the black community who had had this horrific loss. No one would go with him. So he and my mom ended up visiting a, a black family that had been very active in the movement and just kind of sitting with them and absorbing what had gone on. And later that day, my dad drove by the church, bent down and picked up some of the broken stained glass that had come out of the window. That's why my brother's book is called Shattered Glass in Birmingham. We had one, we had actually a box full of broken shards of glass, um, donated some of it to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute a number of years back. And then um, my mother had always hung on to this one piece, which I'll share with you here. This is a photograph of it. This sat on our dining room hutch for years and just reminded us that we had been there for this, had been part of it, and what a, a an important change that had brought to the country. So um, three years ago, I guess it was, longer than that now, 
um, our family decided that we would donate this last piece of glass that we had to the new museum in Washington, D.C., um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you. Now what I'm left with is this photograph and the chance to go and visit it. I brought a book here if you wanted to see. Um, it's one of the items that's documented in this book about the museum because it means so much to people. And during um, the 50th anniversary of that time, I also started a website um, because it seemed really important to me as my brother was writing the book to have had the chance to tell my own story. I had really, we moved away. Right after this happened, I never really thought back about it very much, hadn't made much sense of it. And as my brother and I were talking and, and recalling events as he put the book together, it occurred to me that many other people were children in Birmingham then too and might also like to share their stories. So I started a project that I call Kids in Birmingham 1963. We have three goals. The first is to give people like me and my family a chance to tell our stories. And we have about 55 people who have taken that opportunity half of them black, half of them white. We didn't mix with each other when we were kids, but now we've become a community even from a distance. The second goal, besides telling our own stories and having that opportunity, the second goal is to round out the history because we've all heard of Martin Luther King, we've heard of Rosa Parks, but it was ordinary people that were either part of the movement or standing by during the movement that really made this happen. And the, related to that is our third goal, which is to pass that torch on to today's young people. As Carla said, the job is not done. It is far from done. And we think that by telling our stories, we can inspire that kind of activism among young people. And we have it set up so that people can contact us through the website. We've had over 60 requests for interviews with the press, with uh, high school students who are doing their National History Day projects. And we can arrange interviews by Skype or in person sometimes um, to share our own stories and our thoughts. So I thank you for letting me be part of this event. It means a lot to me. Thank you. And if you'd like to pull a card, we have these around. Thanks, Carla. Thanks. So a museum's job, and this place in which we sit is a museum. A museum's job is indeed one of collecting and preserving history and you don't know what small things in life may take place just picking up that glass and how significant that artifact has been both to Anne and her family and to countless other people because there probably is very little left that's evidence of, uh, of that part, portion of the building uh, that was left there and uh, Anne thank you so much for making the trip in got one more thing to do upstairs and we're, we're ready to go George Wallace was someone that Anne mentioned. I have a terrific gentleman here I met through forensics. He uh, made his way in five hours for us to be here today. Mr. Rich Bollet is going to interpret the words of George Wallace and eventually, as you see on your program, the words of Lyndon Baines Johnson. After Mr. Wallace speaks, we're gonna hear the letter from Birmingham Jail, without interruption, from Mr. Palmer Bunting. I now give you Mr. Rich Follet. Today I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. We remind all within hearing that this Southland, what a Southerner, Peyton Randolph, presided over the Continental Congress in our nation's beginning. That a Southerner, Thomas Jefferson, wrote the Declaration of Independence. That a Southerner, George Washington, is the father of our country. That a Southerner, James Madison, authored our Constitution. That a Southerner, George Mason, authored the Bill of Rights, and that it was a Southerner who said, give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry. Southerners played a most magnificent part in erecting this divinely inspired system of freedom. And as God is our witness, Southerners will save it. 
It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon heartland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as have our generations of forebears before us done time and time again through history. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South. In the name of the greatest people that ever have trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. My fellow clergymen, while confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. I would like to answer your statement with, in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham since you've been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to call on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented. But more basically, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the Apostle Paul left his village in Tarshish and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to four corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. One, collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, two, negotiation, three, self-purification, and four, direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of the country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings in Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers. But the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders in the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that they were victims of a broken promise. So we had no other alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means 
of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. You may well ask why direct action, why sit-ins, why marches? Isn't negotiation a better path? We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I've never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed. According to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the, in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet like speed towards the goal of political independence. And we still creep at horse and buggy pace towards the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see the tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white men and colored. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. And when your wife and mother are never given the respected title of missus, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlining segregation in the public schools, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for the consciously to break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate for breaking some laws and obeying others? To a decree, freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. I had hoped that each of you would understand but again, I've been disappointed. I've heard numerous religious leaders in the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I've longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. Right. I've heard so many ministers say, these are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark cloud of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will soon be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, M.L. King Jr. These are the words of Lyndon Baines Johnson, excerpt from We Shall Overcome. Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. President, members of the Congress, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions and all colors from every section of the country, to join me in that cause. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country, to right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. There is no Negro problem. There is no Southern problem. There is no Northern problem. There is only an American problem. And we are met here tonight as Americans, not as Democrats or Republicans. We are met here as Americans to solve that problem. This was the first nation in the world with the history to be founded with a purpose. The great phrases of that purpose still sound in every American heart. North and South, all men are created equal. Government by the consent of the governed. Give me liberty or give me death. Well, those are not just clever words. Those are not just empty theories. In their name, Americans have fought and died for two centuries. And tonight, around the world, they stand there as guardians of our liberty, risking their lives. Our fathers believed that if this noble view of the rights of man was to flourish, it must be rooted in democracy. The most basic right of all was the right to choose your own leaders. The history of this country, in large measure, is the history of the expansion of that right to all of our people. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult. But about this, there can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no reason which can excuse the denial of that right. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. Yet the harsh fact is that in many places in this country, men and women are kept from voting simply because they are Negroes. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no issue of states' rights or national rights. There is only the struggle for human rights. We cannot, we must not refuse to protect the right of every American to vote in every election that he may desire to participate in. And we ought not, and we cannot, and we must not wait another eight months before we get a bill. We have already waited a hundred years and more, and the time for waiting is gone. Every device of which human ingenuity is capable has been used to deny this right. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that the day is wrong, or the hour is late, or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, he may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out an application, he is given a test. The registrar is the sole judge of whether he passes this test. He may be asked to recite the entire Constitution or explain the most complex provisions of state law. And even a college degree cannot be used to prove that he can read and write. For the fact is that the only way to pass these barriers 
is to show a white skin. Experience has clearly shown that the existing process of law cannot overcome systematic and ingenious discrimination. No law that we now have on the books, and I have helped to put three of them there, can ensure the right to vote when local officials are determined to deny it. In such a case, our duty must be clear to all of us. The Constitution says that no person shall be kept from voting because of his race or color. We have all sworn an oath before God to support and to defend that Constitution. We must now act in obedience to that oath. Wednesday, I will send to Congress a law designed to eliminate illegal barriers to the right to vote. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no issue of states' rights or national rights. There is only the struggle for human rights. But even if we pass this bill, the battle will not be over. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too, because it is not just Negroes, but really, it is all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna Freedom.
overjoyed at the enthusiasm shown by the performers here and the attentiveness shown by you. And it still lets us know there's so much more left to do. Black history matters. We must overcome. So we transition from integration to education. And we're going to take it from local to state to national. Mr. Cole Pettit Johnson, whose father was a principal at a Rosenwald School in Boston. Her mother <coughs> was a teacher. She came up with her parents managing one and two room schoolhouses. Graduated from Marion Smith High School in 19... <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> She found and witnessed the differences all the way up to her retirement from Nandua High School as an instructional assistant uh, in 19, no, excuse me, in 2012. Mrs. Pettit Johnson, you do it better than I do. <laughs> Give her a hand. <laughs> a change in the atmosphere. Over my head, there was a change in the atmosphere. Integration was on its way. In the 60s, I was a student at the one and only Black High School in Accomack County, Mary Nottingham Smith, when the talk began concerning integration. It was somewhat difficult for me to understand. Why, oh why, did they want the black students to attend the white schools? Why? <laughs> we had the newer schools in the county, <laughs> North and South Accomack Elementary, and of course, M&S. Yes. Even with the new schools, there were many issues that needed to be addressed. For a fee, textbooks were rented. Maybe that issue within itself was what, what motivated the black teachers to open every doorway possible leading to knowledge for their students. Many times they had to be created in their own way to keep up with the ongoing process of education. Until there was a plan a, a plan established for what they considered the lower income students to receive reduced book prices of free books, some teachers will actually help to purchase books for their students. Uh, they would. They would go in their pocket, they would go through the neighborhood, they would ask for help for books. Then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, there was a phrase, no student left behind. I would like for you to know, huh, that phrase was already because the black teachers wanted every child they had to succeed. As for me, I did not want to focus beyond the walls of MS. The thought of integration became a dreaded issue. I did not want to transfer to a white school. Being a student, talking with other students, we assumed that it would be something we had to do. I wanted to graduate from m &S. The thought of leaving my friends and teachers was constantly on my mind. Unbeknown to me, there were meetings being held to select students that would become known as the token blacks to integrate the schools. No, I was not one to be selected, thank goodness. <laughs> a friend that attended elementary school with me by the name of Jacqueline Wise James was to be one of the first to enter the 
Georgia Central High School in the fall of 1964. She entered that school alone. Mm -hmm. Alone, person facing uncertainty, Jacqueline stepped forward, helping to pave the way for a new era in the history of Accomack County Blacks. Jackie, as she is known to me, began to climb to the mountaintop with a determination, a determined attitude that she was successfully overcome. I applaud her because she made it to the top. Jacqueline's aunt, uh, Mrs. Griffiths, a dedicated member of the NAACP and a well-known forerunner during the integration movement was instrumental on her behalf. Surely her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Wise, never imagined that their daughter would be a part of Akimak's black history. After graduating from Mary Ann Smith, so they didn't know, <laughs> I attended Norfolk State College and later located to New York. Returning home, I was employed by the Accomack County School System from 1970 until retirement in 2012. Did I tell you that my credential provided the following information? My father, D.C. Raleigh, was a retired principal for Accomack County, and my mother, Etrula Raleigh, was one of the elementary teachers that successfully transitioned from segregation to integration. She concluded her career at Bellhaven Elementary School under the leadership of Mr. Vernon Bell. My first position was at Onancock High School as a reading assistant on the government-funded CEDA program. Eventually, that program ceased to exist. I then transitioned to what was known as the Chapter 1 A's. To be honest, at the beginning of my employment, the teachers and aides were struggling to understand the guidelines. At one school, I was placed in a small room without any assistance with students planning my own agenda. Now, can you imagine me <laughs> planning my own agenda? At one point, I was also asked by assistant principal to keep a time report on a teacher, which I refused to do by reporting to the principal concerning the compromising position. Being assigned to a middle school is when I definitely became aware of integration not working in a classroom. In that room, there was what we began to call a segregation row. No one sat in the middle row. Blacks were seated on one side and the whites were on the other side. And believe it or not, the teacher didn't know what to do with me. She assigned me the task of putting her S and H green stamps in a book. <laughs> it was not until I was assigned to the special education department at Nandua High School that I began to realize the important role of the teacher's assistant. Working with students, no matter their race, has to be a willing effort that is not consumed with financial gain of one status. There has to be a desire to go beyond the goal that is placed before one in a contract. My husband, Jack Johnson, was one of the first teachers to work at Parsley High School. He relates to me that when he began, the letters KKK were boldly printed on the roof of the building. <laughs> I often hear the talk concerning separate proms that Central High School held, one at the country club and the other at the armory. Mm -hmm. Integration could be considered 
as follows. New ideas in the chain for the future brings about fear. Fear is the product of the unknown that derives when new links are added to promote achievement to a stronger change. It is within our ability to awaken our minds with positive impact of wisdom, combining the links of knowledge, both past and present, demolishing fear, continuously replacing it with links of courageous endeavors for a progressive future. Let us not forget the integration motto, we shall overcome. For it, is to, for it to be a success, we have to keep working toward the dream, making it possible for everyone to be able to stand equally I'm saying again, for everyone to be able to stand equally side by side on the mountaintop. Thank you, Mr. Kohler. You know, you have been placated by North Akamak and South Akamak which, by the way, are not schools suited to a temperate area. They had open courtyards, they were breezy, they were drafty. You all know, it was just like, okay, this is the cheapest way you can put up a school, but they were the newest schools. Mm -hmm. And Marion Smith in 1957 was the finest building. Uh, uh, and, and, and to look at it even now, there are very few tiles missing, very few things touched there, and I admire the Alumni Association for its efforts, uh, as well as Anancott High School, uh, which served as a great model for uh, my cousin Betty and Carlene and several other, uh, Mr. West, <coughs> Mr. Allen, several other alumni in preserving those buildings. And um, so they were designed to placate us. Surely if we uh, put up a school that nice, they ain't gonna want to integrate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, the relationships that developed, my mother taught for 40 years, and I see several teachers here, the relationships that developed between the students and teachers, they did not want to leave them. So it wasn't as if, oh, we want to integrate. We were in an element of comfort, of safety, because there was danger out there. There was danger out there. And the relatively peaceful transition that took place here in Accomack County was not quite the same everywhere in Virginia. And Jimerson is going to come and tell you about the desegregation of Virginia education project and probably a snippet or two about some of the not so easy transitions <laughs> in, the, uh, in the state. And give her a hand, guys. <laughs> I want to leave you with three thoughts while you're in this room, and I'll tell you right now what those three thoughts are. The first is I'm about to reveal to you the one and only method that works to close the achievement gap between black students and whites. Second, I'm going to tell you that Virginia's history in relation to school desegregation is outsized for the whole nation. I don't know if all of you are aware of that, so we'll talk about that for a minute. And third, I do want to talk about Dove, the organization for which our esteemed Carla Savage Brown, uh, Wells, <laughs> <laughs> Carla Savage Wells has been uh, regional chair for Virginia's East, uh, Eastern Shore, and we're I'm very excited to have her active role in that, and I'll tell you a little bit about how you can share your stories too to build that history. So first of all. I wanted to listen again today to a story that I heard several years ago on This American Life, the radio program, um, with a writer and a researcher named Nicole Hannah Jones. I don't know if any of you have heard of her, but I listened again to this story. She begins the episode by talking about the fact that in 2003, I think it was, she was studying and really looking into some schools in Durham, North Carolina that were struggling to bring up the level of education among many of the schools there. And she said school district after school district that she visited all had the same box of recipes that they were trying. 
that say, well, let's try magnet schools. We can draw people in that way. Or let's focus on literacy this time. Or we'll build teacher skills. And they all sounded reasonable, but nothing was having any effect. The only thing, the only thing that can close the big gap between achievement of white students and minority students is integration. Mm -hmm. We, our country had a very short history of a true trial of school desegregation. It took from Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 when separate but equal schools were outlawed. It took another several decades before really the country got serious about school desegregation with starting busing and so forth. So in 1971 and then up to the sort of height of the best of school desegregation was in 1988. So we have about 17 years there. One generation experienced mm -hmm. school desegregation. Apparently, in 1971, the gap between white scores on tests and those of black Americans nationwide was 40 points. By 1988, at the height of integration, that gap had closed from 40% to 18%. So it was half. Now at that point, the country just decided that they had tried, they had really tried, and it was just too hard. And we gave up on school desegregation. And as you can look at um, school after school through the country is now 100%, 90% African American or minority, lots of all white schools, and not so much integration. So you can imagine, Hannah um, Jones said, if we had kept on that trajectory, we might have cut it in half again. She doesn't think that we would have gotten rid of all the disparity because there's a long history that led to that, yeah. but we were on a good course. So I want you to take that idea away that the only thing, the only method that really has shown to have a significant impact on that gap is integration. Now, I promised I would mention to you Virginia's outside role, the very large role in the whole country when it comes to school desegregation. First of all, how many of you knew that one student in Prince Edward County, Farmville, Virginia, led a student strike that went to the Supreme Court as part of Brown v. Board decision? Did you know that? Right here in Virginia. Her name is Barbara Johns. I have a copy of a children's book about her. She led a school strike because the conditions in their school in Farmville, it was a beautiful, strong brick building, but it was designed for about a third the number of students that were in it by the late 1940s, early 1950s. And I think it was in 1951, she said, we are striking. The students organized themselves, they marched to City Hall, and they tried to make a difference. And when they got the ear of the lawyers in, the, in Richmond who were, um, working for to change the law, uh, those NAACP lawyers said, well, we can't take on your case just to try to get you a better school building. But if you were willing to sign on and get your parents to sign on to try to change the law to make segregated schools illegal, we can add you to the roles of people. So there were cases in Topeka, Kansas, that's the one where Brown, the name Brown comes from. Um, Several other cases were rolled into one. By the time it was done, I think there were five cases. One of them was Washington, D.C., and they all went under Thurgood Marshall to that decision. Now, that was a positive. On the other hand, as soon as that law was passed, as soon as it was struck down um, by the Supreme Court and uh, school segregation was made illegal, Virginia was among the first to say they were going to resist. Right. Now, when I first heard the term massive resistance, I thought, well, I guess that's what we did in the South, right? Yeah. We were massively resisting. Well, no. <laughs> the wrong way. No. The wrong group. So the white folks, especially in Virginia, but throughout the South and other places too, said, we are resisting this Supreme Court decision. That doesn't rule us. And they built a, an intricate and imaginative architecture, they call it, an architecture of laws that made it illegal, finally, to accept integration. And in that very town where Barbara Johns had lived, led the strike years before, that school system chose to shut down every single public school 
for five years rather than accept integration. Five years those kids were without a school. Now, did the white kids suffer? No, because they managed to get those tax dollars that should have gone to the public schools and siphon them off into the private academies that were whites only. So those kids had schools, but there was a whole generation of kids who were five years behind in their school. So in a very shameful way, Virginia played a huge role, and it showed the other states in the South how it could be done. They led the way. It's kind of an ugly history, and that's why about 10 years ago, actually exactly 10 years ago, our friend and colleague Sonia Yako was uh, in the archives, working in the archives at ODU, right near here, and had somebody come in and ask for some information about school desegregation. And she said, well, let me lead you over. We'll just show you what we have. And they could find nothing. So this history has been suppressed. In 2012, um, so you got some funding to travel through the state and hold events to draw attention to the fact that there was no documented history of school desegregation in Virginia. Um, she got funding for it, and the very first stop was right here in Melfa, Virginia, right here on the shore. That's where Carla and I met. She came in and subjected herself to one of our interviews. Um, those stories that people told, I think we, I don't know if it was a dozen or 20, how many we got that time, but those and some subsequent ones that Carla helped organize um, other groups for people to come in and tell their stories, the teachers, the students, the parents of people who were part of school desegregation here on the Eastern Shore. Um, that first round of collected interviews in 2012 represented the very first documented history here on the Eastern Shore of the, the process of school desegregation. So you should be proud to know that those are now in the archive and available online in the digital collection at Old Dominion University on the Dove website, which we will be happy to share with you. The third thing I was promised to talk about then was that you all can become part of that history. We have your story today. I don't even know if we interviewed you. I don't no, think we, we have. Not. We need to get you on we tape. interviewed her husband. And your husband, we apparently. Did interview, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got We have him. Great, yes. great. So um, all of you who have some experience or some exposure to one side or the other of what that story was like here on the shore, we would love to collect those stories and get them into the permanent collection. So thanks for building the history. Uh, Chris Roll, former student. Yeah. yeah. Give him, give him some, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Chris did a yes. Nando is represented. Chris, did, Chris uh, did a beautiful job in um, documenting what we did last year. And um, maybe next week you might see a story in the Eastern Shore Post about teaching. And several of us are teachers here. My mother taught for 40 years. That was part of the story that I shared with Dove. But I look out here and I look at Chris. And I'm looking at Vashti Harrison, who will be signing her best-selling mm -hmm. hardcover children's book tomorrow mm -hmm. at Book Bin. Yeah. Chris reminded me that he had me during public speaking, uh, a public speaking class that I longed to teach once again, and uh, and Vashti was a member of my forensics team. Uh, Mr. Bolay and I met through forensics. Uh, the rewards of teaching are not all monetary. <laughs> You have to be careful because you can't walk in Walmart and be wrong. Hey, Miss Val! Hey, Val! And I, 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 in my article that you'll read, I just encourage folks that are maybe mid-career and looking for something different, the need is there. Things that you know that you can share if you, if you, when you learn, you teach. And career switching, um, Coursework is available to make it very easy for you to share your knowledge, whether it's career and technical, whether you're a great writer. If you have a bachelor's degree and you're interested in teaching, that, like Mr. Cooper's uh, 
a profession will never go out of style. <laughs> people, <laughs> people are dying. They, yeah. they, they, <laughs> and, and they're being born, and they must be taught. So um, as much as I fought it, when people would look at me and go, you're going to be a teacher like your mommy. Yeah. <laughs> and I would go, uh, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, I look at my daughter and I, I, I think yeah. about how proud my mother would be of her, my mother and father. My mother taught for 40 years. She was the apple of my dad's eye. Uh, my brother uh, told me he waited 40 years for a niece. And she's here taking photographs tonight. It makes her very proud. And she asked me, Mommy, why didn't you go to Mima's alma mater, Virginia State University? I said, I don't know. You tell me. It seems that Old Dominion University is about fifth on your list. <laughs> <laughs> so our children do, we, we raise them to be independent. We raise them to do that. And teaching uh, makes all other professions possible. True. And to that end, the equality of education that Negroes sought is something that had to be demanded. And Thurgood Marshall, uh, I don't, did anyone here see Marshall yesterday? Yes! Yes! yes. Um, Mr. and Ms. Montagna uh, and the film festival. It, it's not a foreign film, but it, it it's a minority film. Wait, wait, wait. We're international film. It, it, America it, is it, part of the international film. International, it, it is. It, Kitty Croft, wow. Ms. Montagna, Kitty Croft, and uh, Tim Croft, Ms. Montagna. I got that confused because we were at Catch the wave last weekend with Governor Northern. Yeah. So I had just been rubbing the elbows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, before I forget, I just want to thank um, my husband. Who, whatever I do, wherever I go, whatever she says, whatever she wants, Good man. he tries to make it possible. <laughs> I remember being at Randy Smith one day, and I said, this is an aside, we'll get back to the show. And I, and I backed up, and I, I backed into my husband, and someone, someone across the table said, you just backed right over your husband. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> so when, when, someone's got your, when someone's got your back like that, it's nothing like it. And uh, so I, I, I want to, uh, I think he was a little mad at me, because he spoke. Um, at, at, in the slave narratives, and mm -hmm. as quiet as he tries to keep it, he's got a little ham in it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but he's he's here in support of what we're doing, and uh, I thank I thank all of my friends. Um, the friend I'm about to call up now, I've known for over 40 years, and this is the third of, of the trilogy that he's been in, and I thank him. He's a member of the board here, and he's going to interpret the decision. Brown versus education as Thurgood Marshall. Mr. Sam Cooper, the Honorable Samuel H. Cooper, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it follows that with education, this court has made segregation and equality equivalent concepts. It makes no great difference whether we say the Negro is wrong because he is segregated or that he is wrong because he's received unequal treatment. These children in these cases are guaranteed by the states some 12 years of education in varying degrees. And this idea, and if I understand it, is to lead to the states until they work it out. The states haven't done anything about it in a hundred years, so for this reason, this court doesn't touch it. There is no way we can repay lost school years. There is a relationship between the federal and state, but there is no corollary or relationship as to the 14th Amendment. The duty of following the 14th Amendment is placed upon the states. The duty of enforcing the 14th Amendment is placed upon this court. I got the feeling on hearing the decision yesterday that when you put a white child in a school with a whole lot of colored children, the 
the white child will fall apart or something. Now everybody knows that is not true. Those same kids in Virginia and South Carolina, and I have seen it, they play in the streets together. They play on the farms together. They go down to road together. They separate to go to school, and then they come out of school and play ball again <laughs> together. They have to be separated in school. They can't take race out of this case. The 14th Amendment was intended to deprive the states of power to enforce black codes or anything else like it. We charge that they are black codes. They obviously are black codes if you read them. They haven't denied that they are black codes. So if this court wants very narrowly to decide this case, they can decide it on that point. The only way this court can decide this case in opposition to our position is that there must be some reason which gives the state the right to arrive at that decision, that for some reason, Negroes are inferior to all other human beings. It can't be because of slavery in the past, because there are very few groups in this country that haven't had slavery some place back in their history of their groups. Mm -hmm. It can't be color because there are Negroes as white as the drifted snow with blue eyes. <laughs> and they are just as segregated as the colored man. Mm -hmm. The only thing can be is an inherent determination that the people who were formerly in slavery, regardless of anything else, shall be kept as near that stage as is possible. And now is the time, we submit, that this court should make it clear that it is not what our Constitution stands for. One of my goals here today was to, to do something that is atypical. Of course, we could have done the I Had a Dream speech. We could have done Phenomenal Woman. Um, but two of the documents that have been brought to you today were never meant to be given as a speech. So for uh, Sam and for Rich and for Palmer to bring them to life to you, um, is, is quite impressive. Please give them another hand. Praise the Lord, church. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Okay. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. I think I want to change the order just a bit. Hallelujah. Just a bit. I'm going to ask uh, that Ms. Nicola Pettit-Johnson start us off to talk about the role of the black church when there wasn't much else for African Americans there was the church Ms. Pettit-Johnson that was the church you better believe that was the church alright don't get around it that was the church yes amen The, the church was considered the hub of the black community. It was not just utilized for spiritual growth. The church was also where blacks gathered mm -hmm. to discuss and plan for their advancement. The church became the means for getting important information to its destination. They would have codes, special songs, special scriptures that they knew may have a certain meaning. Mm -hmm. The ministers worked together, striving for the betterment of their communities. There was a time the churches and <coughs> schools formed a connection that could be considered the hand and glove togetherness. They mold a bond with religion, education, and socialization. What was taught at church 
was carried over to the classroom. Yeah. Prayer, Bible verses, and hymns. And at school, you had to have your Bible verse. Amen. There was no getting around it, and you were not going to get up there and say the same one over every <laughs> For many blacks, the church was most likely the only avenue for them to learn about the depth of their current situation. We have to remember, technology had not arrived on the scene. There were no cell phones, computers, very few landline phones, radios or TVs. Their means of communication was limited. <coughs> Sunday was looked forward to as a time for strengthening one's faith and <coughs> keeping abreast with the current events. That within itself could be one of the reasons Going to church was an all-day affair. <laughs> and I mean an all-day affair. Most people would pack a lunch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it was the people to the audience or said you had a pain or something <laughs> right. You were going to stay in church. The church also provided social activities. Friday night socials, ball games, picnics, and church homecoming. You could have been sure that family members would come home for that special celebration. Mm -hmm. Sunday morning, there was no question. You were going to go to Sunday school, and you were going to hear the preaching of the word. Amen. No matter how long he took to deliver to that word, you were going to hear it. Right. <laughs> the church united the communities reaching out as a source of hope. It was an avenue for blacks without a form of education to express themselves through song and praise. Many would sing their own songs about how they made it through another week's journey. They had a term, if I'm not mistaken, called um, wording, wording out. They would stand up and make up their own songs as they went along. It could be something that happened to them during the week, their <coughs> illness, but they would tie that over with how the Lord brought them to, showing how thankful they were. Church opened up the opportunity for the ones that did not have a form of education to be accepted. They felt as if it was a comfortable place. That's why they could go and <coughs> express themselves. The black churches were instrumental during the integration movement. The ministers united the people for a cause that brought about change to make all people free. It is now up to us to continue striving for equality. We are more persistent tomorrow than it was yesterday and even today. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. And that does make sense. Um, I saw a comedian, you know, I'm a Facebooker. <coughs> and just like a pencil, just like a microphone, just like a gun, any tool is dependent upon the user. Okay? So, uh, I use Facebook, hopefully, for the betterment of myself, for journaling, and for other folks. I saw a comedian talk about uh, being married. He was a white guy talking about being married to a black lady and why they stayed in church so long. But when that was the only outlet you had, you wanted it to last long. It's like when you have a good date. You want the date to last long. Oh, we talked for hours. That's before. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of religion, one of the most charismatic gentlemen to ever hold a microphone, uh, to ever hold elected office. Uh, I wish there were more people around like him today. He was, um, he was a person that uh, they targeted for scandal and uh, like oil or like water on a duck's back, he was able to shake it off. 
Dr. Adam Clayton Powell uh, was a controversial figure. <laughs> I do encourage you to research him if you are not aware of who he was. He was the gentleman who, uh, whose father had Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, the largest black congregation in New York City. And he was studying uh, at Colgate University, passing for white during the school day, and coming back and going to the Cotton Club because he was handsome and loved <laughs> ladies in the evening. He said God spoke to him one night and said, why are you studying to be a lawyer when your father has a church right here? So he does say God called him to be a man of the cloth. And he said the Cotton Club girls wore cloth Shears. <laughs> but this was the kind, this was the kind of gentleman he was, and he didn't take any stuff. So in, in speaking to encourage some folks who were feeling a little sorry for themselves, Dr. Adam Clayton Powell, in the form of my friend of 48 years and another third year uh, performer here at Car Place, Bishop David Sabatino, is going to interpret Dr. Adam Clayton Powell. Some of you say to me, well, I'm not like you. I'm not a congressman. I haven't got education. I haven't got work. But you're a human being. Amen. And you know what you got? You got in your hand the power to use your vote and to use even those few cents you get from welfare to spend them only where you want to spend them. Look at that. A young slave boy stood one day before the greatest ruler of his day. And God said to Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses said, Lord, I've got only a stick. That's all. God said, well, let me use what's in your hand. And he used that slave boy with a stick in his hand to divide the Red Sea, march through a wilderness, bring water out of the rock, manna from heaven, and bring his people to freedom land. What's in your hand? Yeah. What's in your hand, George Washington Carver? Yes. Who was so frail that he was traded for a broken down horse as a slave boy. Mm -hmm. And George Washington Carver, sitting in the science laboratory of Tuskegee, told me, he said, Dr. Powell, he said, I just got, I just go out into the fields every morning at 5 o'clock, and I let God guide me. And I bring back these little things and work them with my laboratory. Mm. And that man did more to revolutionize the agricultural science of peanuts and of cotton and sweet potatoes that, than any other human being in the field of agricultural science. Yes. What's in your hand? Oh, yes. Just let God use it. That's, that's all. all right. mm -hmm. What's in your hand? Yes. I've got a string in my hand. That's all. And I'm flying a kite, and way up in the heavens, lightning strikes. And I, Benjamin Franklin, discover for the first time the possibilities of electricity with a string in my hand. Yes. What's in your hand? Little hunchback sitting in the Roman jail? I haven't got anything in my hand but an old quill pen. But God says, write what I tell you to write. And Paul wrote, I have run my race with patience. Yes. I finished my course. Yes. I've kept the faith. What's in your hand, little boy? All I've got is a slingshot. And the enemies of my people are great and big and more numerous than we are. Well, little David, go down to the brook and pick out a few stones and bring them back. And close your eyes if you want to and put as full back that slingshot and let it go. And David killed the biggest enemy, the leader of the giants, against his people. And his people became free, just letting God guide a stone in his hand. Yeah. And a few years passed, and David is king. And God says, what's in your hand? He says, I've got a harp in my hand. God said, well, David, 
Play on your heart. Mm -hmm. And he played, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. I shall not want. Yes. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What's in your hand? What's in your hand, man hanging on a cross? I've got two nails in my hand. Uh, yeah. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from thee, whither shall I go? And that man with two nails in his hands split history in half, yeah. B.C. and A.D. Uh, yes. And what's in your hand tonight? Yeah. You've got God in your hand, and he'll let you in. Yeah. Because he's on your side, yes. and one with God is always in the majority. Yes. Yes. So walk with him, and talk with him, and work with him, and stick together, and fight together. And with God in your hand, the victory will be accomplished here. Yes. Sooner than you dreamed, sooner than you hoped, sooner than you prayed for, sooner than you imagined. Yes. Good night, and God bless you. your mother, if that's your aunt, 
that you didn't hold the door open for. If somebody shouted at your sister when she's just trying to take an order at the table or just being a cashier at Walmart, mm -hmm. take the time, call people by their names. It's the most beautiful thing in the world, even though, even though some of them are hard to pronounce. I've got to tell you, Miss Paul at, at Nandua High School, when I was pregnant for the first and only time at 40 years of age, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, another whole part of a program that we could have. She said, Miss Wells, please make sure your name, your daughter, something we can pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she said that to me. And I said, I know, Miss Paul. I said, it may not be and in Ika, Isha, or Kwana, but it may not be Heather, Amber, or Megan. <laughs> so just like there are patterns in, there are patterns in every race. I had three Megans in my room that year, and they all spelled their name a different way. So I just want you to know the power of words, the power of what you call yourself. Don't speak negatively of yourself. Don't, don't do that. There are enough people to talk negatively about you. So speak That's life right. to yourself, speak life to those who love you. Mm -hmm. Speaking of love, there was a love that Dr. King had, and he was, a, he was a handsome man, he was a powerful man, and even the ugliest musicians, when they have throngs of people around, they can get the good looking girls. <laughs> the, the musicians marry the models. So Dr. King had his share of, he was a man, and he had his share of dalliances, I'm sure. <laughs> But one woman he loved was Mahalia Jackson. And you may not know that he really spent a great deal of time working on the speech for the March on Washington. But he did not plan the most famous portion of that speech. Someone that he loved whispered in his ear, tell him about the dream of Martin Luther King. And that was Mahalia Jackson. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Katrina, and Katrina is going to interpret a little gospel for us to close us out. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, before we go, I want to make it possible that we all stretch out and that we all link arms, arm over arm, which I haven't seen done in years. <laughs> and we are going to sing, We Shall Overcome. And Katrina is going to sing what she wants to and minister to us in a way that she does like no other and lead us into that. Katrina? <laughs> to reiterate just a little bit, the song that I'm about to sing to you, this was the actual song that she'd sung before, the I Have a Dream speech. Mm. And what pe many people may not know is that Dr. Martin Luther King that particular day had a totally different speech prepared. But after hearing this particular song, and after hearing in the background say, Martin, tell them about the dream. This particular song was so powerful, mm -hmm. and it moved them so much, mm -hmm. that this is the most historical, powerful speech that anyone could ever remember. <coughs> How I got over.